Okay, shall I start? Uh, welcome. Uh, this is uh, the webinar for working together to support the mental health of injured workers. And um, we've now got, I think, 289 people who've joined us for tonight's webinar. And I've been looking at the places that people are dialing in from, and it's just wonderful. You know, um, I think there was someone from Qatar on, online as well. Uh, I'm Prasuna Reddy, and I'll be facilitating tonight's session. Um, I, I work uh, as an organizational and health psychologist. Uh, I'm at the University of Newcastle. I'm a, a professor here, and I'm also the director of the Center for Rural and Remote Mental Health in the School of Medicine and Public Health. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, our panel, and um, uh, I'll be uh, asking each person to uh, tell us a little bit about themselves and specific areas that they that they work in. So um, I'll start with um, Stephen Leo. Uh, Stephen is a general practitioner and joins us from South Australia. Uh, one of Stephen's areas of expertise is pain management. And so by way of introduction, Stephen, I wonder if you could tell us what are some of the important things to know about pain that we're usually not taught um, at university? Uh, I think uh, pain is an experience. Uh, it's very important to know that it is not uh, directly <coughs> pain does not equal injury. Injury does not equal pain. It's an experience. And these experiences happen in the brain. Uh, and it's brain impulses like uh, a lot of other things. And they're influenced by brain and other brain impulses. So. Uh, the psychology is probably one of the most important aspects of uh, dealing with a, pa a patient with pain. Mm. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, and I think we'll talk more about that when we do the case study. Um, uh, joining Stephen is uh, Frank Basie, a physiotherapist. And Frank, you have over 17 years of consulting experience in occupational rehabilitation and injury management. Uh, could you tell us how things have changed over time in occupational rehabilitation? Um, they've certainly come a long way, and a lot of that has been based on the fact that there's much better research and, and, and better understood concepts around return to work and the support that people need. And there's certainly, um, most recently, the understanding about how safe work is, is actually good for health uh, on the back of some of the um, important work that we've even out of the UK, mm. um, I think it's certainly highlighted the importance of return to work um, yeah. and how important it is in the earlier stages to get good outcomes. Um, and I think that has been uh, our industry come along in leaps and bounds in most recent times. Okay, um, I think that's going to be another question that comes up in the case study about returning to work and and what factors can assist. Uh, D.L. Selman um, has joined us too. Uh, D.L. is a psychiatrist and her career is in occupational psychiatry. Uh, D.L., you've worked with a range of stakeholders, uh, insurers, employers, individuals. How do you manage um, or balance the sometimes differing expectations of these stakeholders? Uh, that's a challenging question. I think in the first instance, often there's not different expectations. And the thing I love about working in this industry is that getting an injured worker back to work in a safe and durable manner is the, is the same expectation from the employer to the injured worker, for the treating doctor and for the insurer. They all want the same thing. It's later down the track where problems develop and there seems to be a bit of push and pull. And the way I tend to manage that really is with communication, with open lines of communication. I pick up the phone and speak to all the individual parties. It's about education. It's about making people understand the reasons for the decisions we make and working collaboratively together. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you. I know that's going to come up in the case study as well. Um, and Peter Cotton, um, really good to see you. Uh, Peter is an organizational and clinical psychologist um, now in Victoria. Uh, it's great to have you with us. I know, Peter, you've done a lot of research on organizational environments and how they influence staff well-being and, and performance. So um, can you tell us about some major findings uh, about organizational um, environments related to performance? 
Well, um, I think um, in the organisational psychology world, there's a lot of work on uh, psychosocial qualities work and organisational climate, which do correlate with uh, some of these sorts of outcomes. So um, there are efforts going on to move upstream uh, to work in the prevention space. Uh, better quality people management environments do have less problems. Um, I'm a clinical and org psych, so that's a bit sort of schizoid because the two often don't necessarily come together well. Um, but <clears throat> um, there are good things happening in the prevention space um, because as we'll see when we talk further tonight, once the claim has gone in, things get a lot harder. So the, the um, potential is to move into the more pre-claim, as it's termed, early intervention space and the prevention space. So better people environments is the key. Yeah, I think we're going to hear about early intervention um, mm. a lot more with the case study. Um, thank you all. Uh, I'd like now to uh, look at the learning outcomes. Um, sorry, there are some ground rules that we have um, that I hope that you've had a chance to read and I won't go through them now, but they are on your, um, on your slides. Uh, the learning outcomes, uh, especially uh, we're focused on understanding the relationship between mental health and work-related injuries. And we're also going to look at how different practitioners assess, treat, manage, and support uh, people dealing with a work-related injury. And um, third, to recognize the challenges and opportunities in providing collaborative care. I think that's key to so much of the work that we do in work-related injury. So um, each of our uh, present, uh, each of our panelists uh, is going to speak briefly to the, the case study, and um, I'm sure you have the case study in front of you. Um, the uh, discussion will focus on Matt, and he's suffered an assault in the workplace. Uh, the incident has left him in a state of ongoing distress and feeling incapable of returning to work. Uh, so I'll start with, um, with uh, Stephen, who will give a, a short discipline-specific response to the case study, uh, followed by <coughs> questions and answers between the panel and the audience. And um, Stephen, I'll ask you first to uh, speak to the case study. And you will be doing that. I'm just trying to get my... Okay. Okay. Um, from okay. a general practitioner's perspective. Absolutely. You no, know, looking at Matt, he's a young person. He's mm -hmm. uh, suffered a traumatic, uh, a mentally traumatic incident, and he also has a physical injury, uh, which is a fracture. Now, uh, two important points come up straight away. I mean, the first one is that it's workers' compensation, so that has an influence on, on pain, and the second one is the victim of crime, and that also has an influence on the pain that he suffers. If we look at Matt in the two-week mark, uh, the psychological issues you know, are they being taken care of by the employer? What what are they? What they what what are they doing uh, at the two-week mark? The pain should actually be better at this time. Uh, if anybody has had a fracture, you know that the pain is most uh, right at the beginning, and after one or two days, it starts getting better. Certainly, at two weeks, you should be a lot more comfortable. Then, what medication is for his mental state, and what is his mental state? And certainly taking other people's medication is a huge, huge red flag. That is a giant no-no for, for, for many reasons. Uh, the medication, what is he taking? Is he taking an opioid? You know, what quantity is he taking? Is he potentially addicted to these, these opioids, these narcotics? He and his mother are actually breaking the law and sharing these medications. And then certainly are there any interactions between the prescribed medications? Because not knowing what you're dealing with is very, very difficult, and particularly if you're trying to treat that yourself. If you look at Matt at a six-week mark, the pain should be substantially better. You know, the uh, fracture would have been uh, well uh, on its way to healing uh, and sort of have a, a reasonable strength. Uh, is there something physically wrong? Is there, is there something that has gone wrong with the, with the fracture? Is it not joining? or? Is there conditions like uh, chronic um, <coughs> sorry, uh, regional pain syndrome? There are certainly clear mental issues now. You know, the anxiety is identified, depression is identified, and post-traumatic stress disorder. And 
we talk about threats that he feels. You know, are they are they real threats or are they imagined threats? Is he suffering from sort of paranoia or you know is that the real threat of this chap out there? At 12 weeks, the physical injury should be healed. By 12 weeks, most things are healed. The pain should be gone. Some questions that he's seen lots of doctors. Is he doctor shopping? There's um, an admission of seeing other doctors should would be surprising because. That's not something you tell your treating doctor. Oh, by the way, you know, I've seen Dr. X, Y, Z, A, B, C, and so forth. The use of illicit drugs, again, is, is worrying uh, with the marijuana. And, and what are these pills to help him cope psychologically? I, uh, I just wonder. The, the mental issues are the same. They clearly have not been resolved. So, and, and what are his actual requirements as, um, you know, as stated in the case study? If we look at pain, mood, and sleep. You know, there's a very clear uh, interaction. Pain will affect mood, and pain will affect sleep. Sleep will affect pain, and sleep will affect mood. Mood will also affect pain, and mood will also affect sleep. So there's a clear interaction, and all you need is one of these things to go wrong, or more, you know, and they all affect each other. So uh, always bearing in mind, you know, that uh, certainly, with Matt, you know, there's the sleep and the mood, so he's got the he's got the trifecta. Yeah. Certainly, some questions arise. First one is, you know, whether psychological factors can actually cause pain. If you have purely psychological um, uh, uh, um, psychological uh, factors, can you actually make pain? And the answer is no. And the other, the next question is, can psychological factors modify pain? And the answer here is yes. Can psychological factors make pain persist? And the answer there again is yes. So we've got, um, if we look at that, certainly we've got you know, some, some things that have certainly influences pain. He has a few of the psychological yellow flags, catastrophizing, works compensation, a passive approach to his rehabilitation, an extended rest period and a disproportionate downtime for what he's suffering from, avoidance of normal activity, uh, depression, anxiety, and stress, you know, with loss of control with the stress. You have to ask what the role of medication is within uh, the treatment of depressed moods, you know, SSRI or SNRI to treat that. The anxiety, would you use a benzodiazepine? And certainly in the pain, what are the role of opioids uh, in with him? Do you use them at all or do you tackle things differently? Mm -hmm. so, uh, if we look at uh, a balance between serotonin and noradrenaline, uh, they both modulate pain. Serotonin actually increases pain, noradrenaline reduces pain. And there are medications that actually um, do both. And when you use any medication, uh, particularly antidepressants, you want to know that it probably has a more positive effect on pain rather than a negative effect. Thank you, Stephen. I've taken a few notes from the questions coming and we'll uh, do that after the other presenters. Thank you so much. Uh, just one of the questions that's come up that I'd like you to keep in mind for afterwards is whether you would do a mental health plan as well uh, when you um, see someone like this and what would go into the referral if you were to um, pass that on. So I'll, I'll come back to that when we do that. Um, uh, next, uh, Frank. Um, Frank, would you uh, provide a, a perspective from a, a physiotherapist um, in the in Matt's case, please? Well, looking at this <coughs> with a background of physio, but um, as an occupational rehab provider, and looking at this from the perspective of facilitating return to work, um, I think I've, I'll, I'll go through the main points that I think are the concerns in terms of facilitating a safe return to work and, uh, and talk to those points as we go through. Um, clearly the, the issue of the ongoing pain for what appeared to have been a simple fracture is a concern um, and I'm not speaking any further about it other than uh, to indicate that we may be dealing with a chronic pain condition and with the psychological issues that are largely unmanaged um, that can become a real, a real ongoing issue and uh, the two if they're not managed well, um, can amplify one another. Um, in return to work space, an overprotective or significant support person 
whilst they can be beneficial, can also be very detrimental in the return to work process. And it would appear that uh, uh, Matt's mother is, is certainly uh, someone who fits into that category, and I think that would really need to be managed in the return to work sense. It takes the control and the sense of responsibility away from the injured person um, and we need to bring that control back to them in managing and coordinating and setting, setting some realistic return to work goals that are achievable. The social isolation is also a problem. Um, we know that when people are away from work, um, they lose that important social interaction with people that are important to them on a day-to-day -day basis. In this situation, we've lost that and beyond that now, um, that's lost touch with um, his social circle and his friends and uh, his potential girlfriend uh, for want of a better term. So that is an ongoing issue as well. Um, the fear avoidance behaviours are a real concern. Um, they certainly seem to be well entrenched at this late stage uh, and that is a concern, particularly when we're looking at return to work where um, return to work will be avoided because of the potential uh, for aggravation and, and that potential is the driving factor as opposed to the reality. Um, the report of inability to drive will be a practical consideration in return to work. In a situation like this, you'll often look at facilitating an initial return to work at an alternative workplace so that um, you can facilitate a greater exposure to um, the workplace, etc. In this situation, if he's unable to drive, that may limit his ability, practical ability to get to another workplace. Um, I think there's a real concern about the level and type of communication between Matt um, and his employer. In situations like this, it's not uncommon for an employer to think, well, we'll, we'll step back and stop communicating to give Matt some time and some space. Um, the perception from the other end can be that uh, Matt thinks that his employer doesn't actually care for him and is calling him and staying in touch. And in these situations, the worker or injured worker's perception um, is absolutely paramount, so that needs to be really, really addressed. Um, and again, the fact that he's been, his role has been filled, a, we, we need to address that as well because there may be a perception from Matt that his employer uh, has given his job to somebody else and is not looking after him and not supporting him. So we've got to manage that perception of a lack of support from the employer. Um, the doctor shopping again is an issue because in a situation like this, you need uh, a very um, well-planned collaborative strategy which incorporates and aligns treatment goals with return to work goals. That becomes very, very difficult when Matt is changing treaters on a regular basis. Um, again, the pain medication and or the unmanaged pain medication the use of marijuana is a clear uh, issue. Matt's dyslexia may be a practical issue down the track. Often we'll get people back into a workplace performing alternative duties and often the lightest and simplest task may be simple administration duties. In a situation like Matt's, that may be actually a really difficult proposition because of his underlying dyslexia, and that could add to his anxiety and depression as opposed to uh, relieve it. Um, but the last three are probably the, the real clinches. He believes that he can't return to work. We know that in return to work research, that is the single biggest predictor of whether someone will actually return to work or not, so that mindset needs to be really challenged. He's been off work for quite a long time. We know that uh, chances of people ever returning to work diminish very, very quickly after the initial onset of injury, and particularly so with people who have more than one injury, which is the case in the situation. You've got a combined physical and psychological injury. Um, and the continued certified incapacity is a real issue as well. It works somewhat like a confirmation bias. A person believes they can't work. They go and ask someone that they have respect for, their medical practitioner, who then confirms their belief by providing them a certificate to indicate that they continue to be unfit for work and the whole belief system continues to be confirmed. So that is a real issue. And at this late stage in the track, down the track, you know, we're, we're less than 50% possible chance of ever returning to work just on time alone. Okay. Um, thank you, Frank. Um, just one of the questions that's come up that you might think about um, you know, in the discussion is how much we, would you tell Matt uh, about, um, about recovery early on? Um, what are the expectations that you would put to him? And I think that's an interesting one about you know, whether, um, uh, for motivational reasons, um, how much do you tell him? So uh, we'll come back to that if you would keep that in mind. Thank you. And uh, DL, uh, uh, 
uh, you're next, and um, we'd like you to speak, please, from a psychiatrist's perspective on the case oh. study. I'm getting really distracted by all these comments. There's so many fabulous points. Yes. And I, I've been given five minutes to talk about something that I'd love to just chat about all night. Um, what I'd like to do in my five minutes is leave you with some key messages regarding mental health and wellbeing and work and then talk for a couple of minutes specifically about Matt's case. So the first thing I'd like to share with you is my first take home message which is good work is good for you. And that might seem completely obvious to you but I think unless you turn your mind to it, you don't turn your mind to it. And that's certainly something I wasn't taught in medical school or psychiatric training. So I'm just going to cover it briefly and it will seem very obvious I think. So people at work, what does it give you? It gives you meaning, it gives you purpose, it gives you self-worth, it gives you money to go out and have a good time. For people with mental health difficulties, if work is safe and good, it can be a distraction from the problems that they have. It's the social interaction, it also gives them stimulation, as opposed to not being at work. So often I see people who have been off work for a period of time and they have no meaning, no purpose, their self-esteem is plummeted, they say they can't go out because they've got no money. But more importantly, they've got all this time to sit at home and ruminate about their difficulties and their negative thoughts. They become increasingly isolated, not just from their work colleagues, but they stop going out to see friends. They say to me, what do you think happens when I go to a party and I meet someone? What's the first thing someone says to me? It's, what do you do for work? And I don't want to tell them that I'm off on compensation leave. People at home are bored. If all their friends and family are off at work, what do they do? They sit around at home and they, what, they sleep during the day so then they don't sleep at night. They might engage in unhealthy activities like drinking alcohol and they kind of just spiral out of control. Well, that's what I see anyway. This next slide is really just reiterating my first slide and what I see, I often see people, you know, six weeks after leaving work, three months, six months, nine months and I often, not always, but often just see this spiral of increasing symptoms, increasing sick role, entrenchment and worsening functional capacity and it just gets worse and worse for them. Um, now the evidence is out there that being at work is not just a benefit to your psychological health and well-being. There's a lot of evidence to say that it's actually good for your physical health and well-being. And the um, College of Physicians has recently put out a position statement, or not that so recently, actually, maybe a couple of years ago, to say that not worklessness is equivalent to health risk of smoking 10 packs of cigarettes per day. The outcome from cardiovascular disease, respiratory disease is worse, suicide rates are higher. And it doesn't just affect the individuals, the flow on effect on children is also apparent now with increased rates of um, physical and mental health in children for a work outcomes and educational outcomes. So a few more take home messages. Um, and Frank, Frank touched on this one, that it's important to know that the longer someone's off work, the less likely they are to return to work. So at three months even, the chance of getting back to work at all in the next three months is 50%. And once someone's been off work for about two years, the chance of them ever returning to work is around 5%. These are for people who are on compensation um, claims. So I think what we need to look at doing is try and minimise the time away from work. It's important to know that workplaces have obligations to provide reasonable modifications for their employers. There's anti-discrimination legislation, there's occupational health and safety legislation. So I think I'd encourage the, those of you out there who are, make, who are certifying, when you actually go to write that certification, have a think about it before you put someone off work because you might think you're giving them a gift in the first moment but say, you know, week one, week two, month one, it might, it, it might not be such a gift. So I'd encourage you to think about modifications and you can really ask for anything, whether the employee gives it or not is another story, but I often ask for reduced hours, modified duties, longer time frames in which to complete tasks, reporting to a different manager if there's problems with management. The next point I wanted to leave you with tonight is that so often I see people write reports where they say, yes, once my patient recovers, I'll go back to work. But if we're aware that actually being off work is adversarial to someone's health and wellbeing, then surely returning to work has to be part of the recovery process and not something that occurs after recovery. Thank you, Danielle. Uh, DL, one, um, one of the questions, the intriguing questions that's come up, which we might tackle yeah. is, um, how do you put return to work um, versus recovery and improvement in mental health? I mean, so you know, how important is the, the return to work or focus on mental health improvement? So we'll come back to that, I think, because of the emphasis on return to work when we, um, we come to the general discussion. Is that okay? I think they go hand in hand, but I've still got a couple more slides. Oh, go ahead. Okay, then. Yeah. 
Okay, so I just want to spend a couple of minutes talking about Matt's case in particular. And for me, there are a lot of alarm bells in Matt's case, which can be generalised to other cases as well. So first of all, there's his limited education, training and experience in his dyslexia. That's going to limit other job opportunities available to him if he can't go back to his current workplace. He's obviously had the traumatic experience at work and he's got a fear for his safety, which is going to make it harder for him to get back. Comorbid mental and physical health symptoms notoriously have a worse outcome than if there's just a psychological condition on its own. He's functionally impaired, which is associated with a worse outcome. He's been off work for that kind of magic three months mark where it's starting to become chronic. There's substance misuse, and I know he says he's using just a bit of marijuana and a bit of alcohol, but in my experience, you've got to double or triple what he says he's using, and that's probably closer to what he is using. There's a family history of somatisation and possibly chronic pain, and there seems to be a stigma about mental illness, and a, his, his mother's shielding him from returning to work. We don't know why. She might have her own issues. Um, but that's something that's going to get in the way. He's also not really engaged in treatment. And where's the employer support? I saw someone's comment saying, where's, where's, the, um, where's the flowers and the cake exactly? There's been not much there at all. And the fact that he's got the compensation claim also leads to a worse prognosis. Mm. Um, so just a couple more slides. I put this one up. I know this isn't a psychiatric lecture, so I'm not going to go into all his specific symptoms, but just to make a couple points. When someone's got phobic anxiety and phobic avoidance, it's obviously it's often very difficult to get them back to work and I think these are the ones that we have to try and get back to work sooner rather than later um, because without getting back to work the, their anxiety and avoidance is just going to escalate. Um, which I've put functioning up here. So often I see people talk about symptoms and diagnosis without much emphasis on functioning and I think if we can turn our mind to functioning being a measure of someone's well-being then that's a really positive thing. I mean in my experience someone who's going to work with some anticipatory anxiety and apprehension is doing much better than someone who doesn't have that anxiety but is sitting housebound increasingly isolated. So just in terms of what I do with Matt moving forward, I, I've said make time and I think that's really important because often when there is a compensation claim, the time with the clinician becomes about filling in claim forms rather than doing some active treatment. So I think we need longer appointments for these people and more time. There needs to be support, psychoeducation, alignment with him, being on the same page. Assessing risk, not just the risk for himself, but the risk of, that, that he describes with this other person. I'm not sure if it's real or imagined, it's probably imagined. There needs to be early collaboration between all the stakeholders and there's nothing wrong with picking up the phone and speaking to the employer or the rehabilitation provider. Early referral to a psychiatrist or psychologist and addressing the barriers like fear and stigma. In terms of treatment, um, I mean the main stage of treatment are going to be the um, trauma-based cognitive behavioural therapy. And medications, this man's probably going to need medications at this point. I know he's reticent to take medications, so you might use one with a side effect profile that's of benefit. So hey, how about we put you on some duloxetine to help with your sleep, sorry, with your pain, or mecazepine to help with your sleep. And this man's going to invariably have significant side effects from his medication and not want to persist with it. So it's going to be about educating him about the side effects, going low, starting, starting at a low dose, and giving him an expectation for when he should achieve an effect. Um, and then early rehabilitation and a graduated return to work program. If this was my man day, why not be getting him back to work in the back office doing something with someone taking him to work at reduced hours? The horse is bolted on that, so it's more about now work hard and second activity scheduling and all those things. But my last point is that returning to work is a time to increase treatment, not reduce treatment. Oops. Question that's come up while you were speaking is um, when is a psychiatric referral required? So that might be, again, a point that we take up in the case discussion. Is that OK? Thank you so mm -hmm. much, Dio. And um, Peter, uh, you're going to uh, present uh, a psych <coughs> psychologist's perspective. Um, OK, well, um, because I knew that my colleagues here would so ably talk about Matt, I, I made a few brief points in the last slide, so I'll come to that about Matt. But what I thought would be helpful would be to try and uh, present uh, some comments from the other side. Uh, Steve and Frank and Dale have touched on these points. Um, but just to sort of summarise, um, people who have a conversation claim move into a very vulnerable population. And uh, as DL indicated, outcomes are often worse. Um, but for example, the mental and physical health of unemployed Australians is up to four times worse than people engaged in employment. Um, but health professionals aren't taught much at all uh, about the role of work in contributing to uh, mental health and wellbeing. Um, 
insurers overall, um, you know, th there's lots of sort of local issues about, you know, subcontracted insurers and turnover of staff and case managers and inexperienced people saying silly things. But at a big picture level, um, what the insurers want to achieve is, is positive health and return to work outcome. Um, <clears throat> as has been emphasised, early return to work is by and large, early and safe return to work is by and large much more appropriate than uh, keeping people off for a long time. Um, DL has indicated uh, the data around the longer people stay off work, the worse their outcome. Um, <clears throat> and one example I'd like to uh, indicate, um, because I often talk to sort of, um, you know, seasoned clinicians who tell me, you know, how serious the treatment is that's needed for people in this space, and some people do have much more complex needs, but um, the evidence shows that uh, return to work considerations and the role of work as a therapeutic factor should be an integral part of the treatment, not something that happens subsequently. And one recent example I can point to, uh, most people will be aware of Origin, our, one of our premier youth mental health services in Australia. Uh, Origin released a report in the last couple of months, um, it's available online, it's called Tell Them They Are Dreaming and it's about young people with serious acute mental illness and employment. And they make a couple of key points. One, uh, individuals with acute psychosis and other serious conditions, basically the top priority whenever you survey in different ways is that they want to engage in work. Um, for all the reasons DL indicated about social inclusion, about meaning, about structure and so on. The second thing is they provide um, evidence-based treatment to these people. It is structured, it is targeted, uh, they have case formulations and engagement with work is an integral part of the treatment. It's not something that happens after the treatment. So when you stand back and think about this population and compare with the workers' comp population, something seems to be happening quite differently. Um, I think uh, a lot of practitioners, uh, particularly the psychologists, are geared up to working under Medicare where you have a 10 session limit each year and it doesn't matter what happens otherwise but you've got your 10 sessions. With this population, we do need to be much more structured, we do need to be more targeted and often we do need to be much more directive. Um, <clears throat> with, um, with Matt, I think the, the one sort of psychological bit of input uh, that, that I thought of would be um, he, he needs to access uh, what in the jargon is called trauma-focused cognitive behavioural therapy, which is the treatment of choice for PTSD. Um, PTSD uh, is a significant risk factor for uh, moving on to chronic and persistent pain. Um, so we need to work concurrently. Um, so he needs the physiotherapy, medical involvement, addressing the physical injury, but what's clear is that he has not had early access to the most appropriate treatment for his mental health symptoms. If he's too distressed to respond to that, then uh, DL and her colleagues come in and can provide uh, appropriate uh, psychotropic medications that might uh, settle him a little bit and help him to be more responsive. But that's what he needs to move on to. Um, with individuals um, in Victoria, for example, WorkSafe Victoria has uh, 10 or 12 uh, approved pain management programs, multidisciplinary programs. Um, they've been evaluated and we know that they help people reduce pain, cope better, get back to work, or people who are at risk of going off work stay at work and, and get off their horrendous sort of narcotic, uh, chronic sort of long-term uh, narcotic analgesic medications. Um, but um, what happens is there, a PMP, payment management program, is often regarded as a last resort. It typically doesn't happen until more than 12 months post-injury. And we now have a KPI of trying to bring this back to three months because we can identify at that point um, when an individual will benefit from this type of program and should be referred. So one of the things, for example, that's happened in Victoria is that WorkSafe has now opened referrals beyond GPs to physiotherapists and psychologists to refer directly to pain management programs. Um, I can see the slide there. That there's some evidence that you can look up. Um, but uh, this term work-focused treatment as opposed to more 
um, uh, standard clinical care, work-focused treatment uh, achieves much better outcome. The longer someone stays in the compensation system, the worse their overall outcome will be. So we do need to do things a little bit differently than standard care. Um, we now have a thing called the National Clinical Framework, which all jurisdictions have adopted and major professional associations have uh, endorsed. Um, occupational physicians are on board. Other medicos, not quite yet, but we're working on that. Um, but that framework details best practice principles of treatment. Um, these people, as I said, typically need more structure. Um, more broadly, a comment about mental health more broadly is um, uh, I've just been working more in a sort of managerial context the last few weeks at looking at how managers deal with mental health in the workplace. Beyond Blue tells us that uh, stigma's reduced, we're all more willing to talk about mental health, yet we know that there's still a lot of avoiding. People avoid talking to individuals, engaging with them, trying to encourage them to access help. Um, there's a fear of aggravating things, so there's more of a hands-off approach. There's avoidance, there's less structure. Um, so people are often left much more to their own devices relative to how we manage physical injuries. This is the opposite of what these people need. Um, so I'd encourage people to sort of perhaps look at what Orangen does with a more serious population and the role of work um, in, in more serious mental illness um, because I think we can do a lot better um, in the work cover nationally compensation jurisdiction. The final point I'd make, which is not on the slide, is that um, uh, some work I've done in different jurisdictions and with colleagues and in the UK indicates that about a third of all psychological injuries are more based on low morale rather than a substantive increase in mental health symptoms. So what that suggests is that these people, what they actually need is vocational guidance, vocational assessment, HR management, conflict resolution. When they get into the medical system, well-intentioned psychologists and, and GPs give them this dreadful label called adjustment disorder. Anyone ever heard of adjustment disorder? <laughs> um, when they get that label, they often get worse over time. So there are some positive initiatives trying to address that issue. Triaging claims, which is mentioned in the slide. Uh, in Victoria, there's a program called the Workplace Support Service, which tries to address interpersonal issues early. Queensland has a state-based program called Resolve at Work, where they, again, it's about moving upstream, trying to address work relationships before they go off the rails and people get to the point where they need to put in a claim or, or lodge a complaint. So uh, moving upstream into that pre-claim early intervention space is, is, is really the key. Um, but um, I think we can do a lot better tightening up and looking after these people um, much better. Uh, my last point would be, um, I suppose, uh, recently I talked to an audience of, <clears throat> dare I say, because there's some on the line, very precious clinical psychologists about um, how they work with some of these complex cases. And my response was to point to the work that Origin does and to indicate that um, we need to come at the other way. We need to have a focus on return to work as part of the treatment and triage out if the person's too chronic and severe to move forward in that direction. It's hard to tell and predict at the beginning, but we must have that return to work focus as integral to the treatment from the word go um, and uh, look after people otherwise if, if they're not going to move forward. Um, that's probably enough. Um, so um, it, it is the case that um, in Australia generally, and I'm sure people read this sort of data, um, we have had very liberal certification practices. There has been a significant drift towards longer time off work, disengagement from work and drifting onto DSP. The biggest growth in disability support pensions has been in milder mental health problems and chronic uh, non-specific back pain musculoskeletal injuries, and um, the evidence is that a lot of those people, if we'd reached them much earlier and engaged them in some sort of return to work, um, we could have prevented what's been termed, perhaps provocatively, and I apologise for this, but medically unnecessary disability. So that's what we need to address in this space. Um, but again, overall, we're all trying to achieve the same objective, so um, there, are, there is the emergence of work-focused treatment training, 
and there are various programs around now that, that work with GPs, psychologists, um, trying to help them align what they do when they deal with anyone who has a, a compensation claim. They'll perhaps do it for soon. Okay. Um, and thank you, Peter. One of the questions that's come up that I'd like you to address when we have our discussion is um, what, uh, what exactly does triaging out mean? Um, okay. So if you would, if you would keep that um, in mind. Sure. Uh, now we have uh, an opportunity for uh, a panel of questions and answers. And I'll start first with um, whether any of the panel members would like to uh, pose questions to each other and then we'll take questions from the audience. So, um, who, who do we have? Uh, Stephen, Frank, uh, Dio, Peter, uh, do you have a, a question you'd like to pose before we go to the audience questions? No, not okay. for me. I'm happy to take questions from the audience. All right, let's go then. Um, uh, the questions that that I outlined uh, that were coming up as we were talking. One uh, addressed to Stephen specifically was about um, uh, a mental health plan. And um, would you do a mental health plan uh, automatically when um, when you see someone? And what are the likely things that you put into that plan when referring to a psychologist or a psychiatrist? Uh, certainly, the mental health plan is actually for uh, non-insured uh, patient. In, uh, <clears throat> in Matt's case, he is clearly under workers' compensation. So all of the funding would come from the workers' compensation side rather from a mental health care plan. So although uh, the, the plan is a good idea and all of the elements of the plan coming together and seeing that he gets holistic treatment, you don't really need a plan for, the, uh, for Matt in particular. Okay. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> The uh, question for uh, Frank, um, which had to do um, with um, motivation uh, uh, versus um, uh, perhaps reality, uh, is um, how much uh, would you say about um, expectation for full recovery and return to work early on? Because you did talk about early intervention and how important it is to have people return. Absolutely. Look, I think the focus with these people needs to be more on function as opposed to their pain and their dysfunction. Um, certainly, we're dealing with two issues here. We're dealing with physical injury um, and the unmanaged pain that goes along with it. Um, and because of the fact that it's been longer than three months, it's certainly chronic. There's also the unmanaged psychological um, symptoms conditions as well. You need to set return to work as part of the treatment and functional goal. Um, and obviously there's a lot of evidence out there to indicate that it, it is good for you, provide that it's safe and we need to take all those things into consideration, etc. Um, but that needs to be set really, really early on in the piece um, so that there can be some very, very gradual graded progression along the way and so that there's alignment of um, treatment goals and return to work goals because honestly with good management they should end up at the same place. So yes, you, you should educate um, Matt in the early stages um, on the importance of return to work, on the importance of return to work being an indicator of a return to function um, and the, an indicator that it's also um, showing that he is on the path to recovery as well. Okay. Um, one of the questions from the audience too was uh, about barriers. Um, what are the biggest barriers to return to work for people who have a psychological injury at work? Look, um, it, it depends on the on the, the circumstances of each case. Um, um, the way you would manage someone you know, who has depression would be somewhat different. Who has mainly anxiety, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But there needs to be real support from an employer to assist someone in, in a situation like Matt to return to work. Um, that's absolutely critical. Um, that support needs to be real. There needs to be a management of um, the perceptions of the other people in the workplace so that um, the person who comes back to work, such as Matt, doesn't feel that he's on 
the support from his employer and from those around him. That's really critical to make an initial return to work um, stick. And then obviously needs to be management of any of those factors that may jeopardise the return to work being sustainable as well. So cognitive function has been impacted, then certainly don't give him um, very, very intensive cognitive tasks. If concentration is being affected, then you would have to pick the duties that he does accordingly. If anxiety is an issue, then perhaps you keep him away from um, a lot of customer contact, etc., to manage those symptoms. And you'd have to do a lot of work very closely and collaboratively with his treaters to make sure that the tasks and the environment were well suited to facilitate ongoing recovery. Okay. Okay. Um if I could move um, a, a little beyond the individual, thank you. Um, and um, it, I think this is a question I'd like to ask uh, uh, DL, um, because we talked <coughs> a lot about co um, uh, collaboration. And some of the comments coming through are, well, you know, collaboration is uh, ideal, but also extremely difficult. And there's often um, a distrust in workers' compensation settings between health professionals, doctors, employers, uh, that can lead to conflict. So um, let me turn the question to how can we build trust so that the injured worker is protected um, from the conflict? What are the kinds of things we can do uh, from that collaborative practice framework? And I think there's every reason to work on a premise of trust rather than distrust. And I think the distrust comes in way down the track when injured workers are quite entrenched in the sick role and don't feel they can return to work and the treating doctors feel that getting back to work would be adversarial. So I think the way to build trust is really to start early, day one of injury. And I think it's about um, talking together and providing information. So I mean often the workplace will get a certificate that says, you know, Joe blows unfit to work for the next month because of a medical condition. So you can understand from their perspective that it doesn't help them very much. They don't know what's going on. They don't know what they're supposed to do with that. So I think the more information you can provide the employer, obviously with the consent of the individual, the more equipped that they are to help out, to feel compassionate, to, to plan their workload. Um, and I think that it goes both ways. I mean, the, the GP or the treating practitioner is only hearing one side of the story about the workplace difficulties. If there's open communication with the employer as well, there might be another side as well. And with that open discussion and communication, there's generally the chance for collaboration. So I think education is really the most important thing. And then goal setting steps at a time with a framework in place. So if you're returning an injured worker to work and the employer says, I'm worried they're not necessary, I'm worried they're not well enough, well then we'll review it in three weeks or we'll review it in four weeks. Or for the employer who goes, I don't know that I'm ready to go back to work, to say, well, we're not signing you up for a life sentence here. If it's too hard, then we'll step back or we'll stop the return to work plan or we'll modify. So I think it's all about engaging, collaborating and aligning and aligning ourselves most specifically with the injured worker because unless they're on side with any return to work plan we're going ahead with, it's not going to work. So I spend a lot of my time in sessions with the individuals, you know, getting them to say how many hours they think they could work week one or week two, and then ring the employer and say, this is what we're doing. And I think that really helps build trust as well. Okay. Okay. Um, Peter, I'm going to move to you uh, just to follow on from uh, some of the um, collaboration work. It's, it's the question of can you please explain the triage out? And, um, and there's also <coughs> been a, a question about um, compensable a psychological injury and an incubation period of six months. So could you explain okay. this? <clears throat> All right, perhaps taking the second question first. Um, uh, I think that comes from some, uh, some work I've done with uh, Comcare and other people uh, similarly done, indicates that your average psychological injury never occurs overnight. There is typically at least a six month gestation period where there are certain characteristics that become evident. Um, for example, taking more time off work, disengagement, uh, becoming uh, more negative about things, withdrawn, avoidance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, what the, the practical point of all that is to indicate that um, if we're getting managers as people managers to be more proactive and, and have their finger on the team pulse and knowing their stuff, we can potentially identify these people earlier. We do not want managers to become diagnosticians or quasi counsellors. But managers do have a role in providing or fostering an environment that people believe that the employer values their well-being and that if they have hassles, they can put their hand up early 
and get supported in terms of moving on to appropriate assistance, whether it's employee assistance program, seeing their family GP and a referral to a community-based psychologist, or also in this day and age, uh, e-mental health. Australia is a world leader in e-mental health and the resources there are massively expanding and the evidence is that for many mild to moderate uh, anxiety depressive conditions, they're achieving comparable outcomes. Uh, let's not forget that from a mainstream public mental health point of view, roughly a bit under half of all people with genuine mental health disorders do not access treatment for a whole range of reasons. So um, the online option is expanding the, the armamentarium as it were. Um, now the other question was, just remind me for a second, sorry. Um, it was about triaging out. Yes, yeah, sure. Um, I think um, uh, a lot of the uh, work covering insurers are now starting to triage claims. Uh, Victoria does it, CAC Victoria does it. Uh, a lot of the providers, a lot of the big Commonwealth agencies, they have algorithms to identify complexity because we can, the evidence says we can um, predict the complexity, the, the high risk of staying off work a long time very early on. Therefore, we can um, plan better in terms of uh, treatment we provide. Um, I mentioned earlier that pain management programs are often not until uh, 12 months later. We know that we can potentially identify before three months and refer people at that point and we'll get much better outcomes. Similarly, often the psychology services, uh, one of the um, uh, reasonable complaints psychologists tell me about when I'm talking to them is that, well, I didn't get referred this person until 6, 12, 18 months after the injury, so how do you expect I'm going to get them back to work with a few sessions? Very reasonable complaint. So um, getting more of that, aware of that mental health dimension, uh, triaging and identifying, streaming into appropriate intervention. I mentioned the workplace support service that WorkSafe Victoria runs. They've also started a new program called the GP Influence Strategy where claims are triaged and our medical advisors talk to GPs and try and get at least partial clearance there very early on. Um, apropos of that, um, some people will be aware, we now have a trial of what's called a FIT certificate in Victoria, Canberra and Western Australia and that is aimed at certifying people more on the basis of what they can do rather than what they can't do and on the basis of capacity. When you're dealing with a distressed worker, often, um, and, and it's no one's fault, but the treating, treaters often get a jaundiced view of the workplace. People are trying to make sense of things and they often make attributions which sometimes aren't accurate. Not, not all employers are toxic or evil. Um, most of the employers I work with, uh, there are some dark places out there, no doubt about it. That's why we do need strong workplace health and safety laws. In Victoria, we've had 40 prosecutions in the last couple of years. And if you read those transcripts, they do tell you about some evil things that employers do. But the majority of employers with the majority of working Australians are trying to do the right thing, but often they're not knowing what to do. And the polarisation that happens, um, getting more distant um, from treaters, treaters getting into more advocacy, uh, employers then thinking they don't want to, it's all of that stuff, uh, we, can, we, can, we can manage that much better um, working more collaboratively. Um, so triaging out means, um, uh, I mentioned the third of, of the population in the psychological injury world that are more low morale based. UK has found exactly the same thing, that it's not a medical barrier to return to work, it's a psychosocial barrier, family problems, hating your job, don't get on with your manager, etc, etc. So those people need more psychosocial interventions more than medical treatment um, and, and I include psychology in, in that sort of uh, approach there. Um, so um, we've, uh, there's been a review of the workplace support service that says it is achieving better return to work outcomes um, because what we do is appoint an experienced rehab provider and their role then is to liaise between the parties, try and get them talking run facilitated discussions and try and address the interpersonal barriers. The uh, research I pointed to, the, the Lagerfeld paper about um, work focused CBT, what they do is part of the treatment from the word go is talking about work and identifying the problems and barriers. Uh, some people are very distressed obviously and they don't want to talk about it but seeding and starting that discussion, identifying the barriers, progressively problem solving them and engaging in exposure to the work environment achieves much, much better outcomes rather than thinking that anything to do with return to work is subsequent to the treatment. 
Uh, so there are various triaging tools based on um, uh, actuarial data, some of them based on more psychosocial and, and demographic characteristics. Um, TAC, for example, uh, their triage tool is more than 85% uh, accurate in identifying very early claims that are likely to become highly complex in the long run. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's Frank back. I because um, otherwise I'll, I'll, I'll put the question to, uh, to, to Peter. Yeah. I'm here on audio, but right. here, in, okay. here in black. Um, if Frank, uh, we, we talked <coughs> earlier about, um, and, and some of the points that Peter has raised as well, about um, people, uh, in, injured workers, uh, being traumatized by the process, <laughs> uh, <coughs> yeah, the legal process, um, and then um, the systems in, in work cover and, and so on. Um, wh what are the kinds of things that can be done to manage uh, these problems. I think you mentioned there were um, workplace inspectors and others that could assist uh, in. Absolutely. Um, in, in situations where we find employers are not fulfilling their obligations with regard to return to work and supporting their injured um, employees, then there are workplace inspectors who can go out um, and impress upon the employer their obligations and their need to to support their employees. Um, but beyond that, um, the role of an occupational rehab provider can often bring all the parties together um, and establish some common ground and some common goals and then move everybody forward. Because um, I made this point earlier on that the system and the treaters um, and the employers and the injured workers' goals really should be all the same, which is um, recovery from injury, um, return to normal function, return to normal activity, and return to work is part of that process as well. Um, the process can get a bit convoluted when the parties miscommunicate and think that uh, people aren't fulfilling their obligations. And often that can be a communication breakdown and a misunderstanding of what each person's roles and responsibilities are. But with clarification and effective communication, those barriers can normally be broken down quite effectively. In the event that they aren't, then you've got to look beyond that to see if there are some real significant issues that are brewing there in the background. And honestly, it's good to have a rehab provider involved in those situations because if you don't delve into them and if you don't determine what those issues are and develop strategies to resolve them, you're not going to progress along the path of recovery and return to work. Okay. Um, I'd like now uh, to uh, go back to each of our panel members uh, to uh, reflect and sum up. You've also been seeing some of the comments that are coming in um, from uh, participants and if you'd like to pick up some of those as well. So I'll uh, go back to Stephen. Uh, who presented from a GP perspective. Uh, Stephen, have you, um, would you like to reflect or take a couple of minutes and um, also any comments that you've seen coming in that you'd like to comment on yourself? Mm. Now, certainly looking at a pain perspective, uh, Matt is a clear case where multidisciplinary treatment is essential. I, I don't think it's handleable by just one single part of the of the team. You have to have the whole team approach. You have to have them coordinated and you have to have them talking to each other. Um, I saw on the chat that uh, certainly case uh, conferencing, case conferencing is, is, a, is a brilliant idea, gets everybody talking. I, and the other thing I think is honesty. Now, what does employer really want out of this? Does he want to get rid of Max? Is he, is he, is he aiming to, um, <coughs> to get him back or um, <coughs> Is he going to get him replaced or get him put somewhere else? Uh, I think all of these things are really important. And if people have a um, an honest discussion, then you can you can progress along the, the correct pathway. Uh, and, and the last thing, if I go back to my first comment about pain, pain is very very largely influenced by a lot of psychological factors. In fact, it's a major influence uh, between going from an acute pain to a chronic pain. And, and always to remember that and to uh, get early referrals rather than uh, let things settle in too much and certainly getting back to work as soon as possible should be the ideal goal. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, Frank? Yep. Would you um, like to uh, reflect on what we've discussed and also any of the comments coming from the participants that I haven't picked up? Um, I think there's been some fantastic comments made by all the participants and uh, it's been um, interesting reading them all and some very, very valid points. Um, I think that um, in situations like this, we can often be overwhelmed by the complexity of uh, the presentation in front of us um, and I think that we need to at times um, get back to the grassroots which is getting all together, communicating, setting some realistic goals, letting everybody know that uh, we're talking about return to work as part of function and, and, and recovery um, and that if we can set some realistic tangible goals and if we have the honest involvement and goodwill of all the participants then we can achieve some fantastic outcomes and there have been some fantastic outcomes that I've seen in many years of doing occupational rehab for people with some really severe combined physical and psychological injuries that you would have that have, have come through with some real genuine understanding, um, goal setting um, and willingness to work together. Uh, and collaboration on a treatment plan um, that has worked for everybody and has ended up uh, as a really, really, really good outcome. Okay. okay. Um, Dio, I'll uh, call on you now uh, to uh, reflect and, and maybe pick up the question about when is a psychiatric referral um, required. So maybe I'll start with that question <coughs> first. I think a psychiatry referral is required early in these cases and not because I want extra work or other psychiatrists do, but I think when someone's impaired enough to have you know, not be able to work, then that's a sign of a pretty significant illness of, of some sort. And often there's a lot of other factors going on that need addressing. And I think just like if you've got someone with a heart problem, you'd refer them to a cardiologist. If you've got someone with enough mental health symptoms to preclude them from working, then they, they warrant assessment by a psychiatrist, even if it's just for diagnostic clarification, looking at what, for what other comorbidities there are and treatment recommendations and return to work planning. In terms of my points for summing up today, I think I want to return to my initial point that good work is good for you. And I've seen lots of comments here about what about the hostile workplace and obviously the hostile workplace is not equivalent to good work. Um, so, you know, we have, we have to address those issues as well. But I think what we're all trying to say here is, is we don't see returning to work as the end goal. We see recovery as the goal. And return to work is part of that recovery, but just like a comment I saw about what if you can't do your bra up, obviously if you can't function in the activities of daily living, no one's going to be saying going back to work. What we're saying is that return to work needs to be planned for in a stepwise progression and returning to work is an important part of that recovery process. And obviously different conditions, different employers, um, different people will require a different rate of returning. But that should be the goal from the, from the first day of being off work. Okay. Um, Peter? Um, well, without repeating things, uh, just note, um, uh, for example, ComCare has started funding pre-liability treatment because there's recognition of what happens in the first three months after a claim is submitted can be really crucial in terms of shaping um, the overall direction and trajectory. Um, so that's one positive uh, factor. Um, the other thing I saw a couple of comments around is the, the issue of litigation. Uh, this is always a challenge. In most of the state schemes, people have access to common law. We don't in the Commonwealth. But the challenge is, and, and there's actually some research on this, um, some people start mental health treatment the day after they've seen their lawyer and there seems to be some sort of tacit understanding developed that uh, it will add 10% to your common law payout. Uh, now, the, the overall challenge is that no one can retire on a common law payout. You can't buy your, your dream house and your, your, your boat. Um, so people often develop uh, you know, uh, misinformed views about where they're heading. Um, what I do in my private practice, um, if, if I don't feel I can help someone um, or I don't feel they're motivated because um, they're sort of getting entrenched in that sort of uh, perspective, I will tell them that I, I can't help them. Perhaps they should see someone else um, because there's a waiting list. Um, uh, perhaps also just to indicate, uh, you know, as I say, there's a lot of positive things happening. The Comcare Act has been reviewed. 
Um, so there are changes coming in terms of trying to get the incentives right because one of the problems with Comcare, for example, the Commonwealth system is that um, there are perverse incentives once people get into the system to stay there, um, to settle in there and, and avoid uh, engaging with return to work. So um, there are changes coming. Um, it is always a challenge to get the settings right to genuinely support and reasonably compensate injured workers but also to encourage people to re-engage with employment because that is better for their long-term uh, health uh, outcome. Um, so that's probably enough. Thank you. Okay. Um, when I uh, consider you know, much of the conversation that we have, um, it seems to me that the importance of a collaborative practice in this industry and in the interventions we do um, is, is absolutely crucial. And, um, and particularly in treatment options as well as a return to work and, and a shared vision. And, and I'm wondering you know, for all of us, uh, the, the take home message in that, because we do come from different perspectives and different expertise, and when it, it comes to the injured worker, we're dealing with a lot of systems that we don't really um, have expertise in. And, and um, in my experience, you often come across different ethical codes. <coughs> Uh, about sharing information or um, you know what's required. So um, I wonder if each of us could address that, like that, a message about collaboration because that's really what's needed in, in managing this area. Sure. Well, look, briefly I can speak to Comcare in Victoria and the other jurisdictions are similar. Uh, when a person puts in a claim, they do sign um, <coughs> a consent that uh, allows the work cover authority to talk to their treaters about their injury and recovery, not about other personal stuff. Um, so that is there and, and the focus should be on the injury and recovery and return to work. So that, that's probably the key point there. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Uh, Frank, would you like to um, talk about that as well, it, uh, you know, a, a, a goal um, that actually involves collaboration? I think we've lost. Uh, we we don't have the sound for Frank. Oh, is it there now? Yep. Now we do. Yeah. Okay. So I think the point to make here is that the earlier you get onto this, the better, because the the clock starts ticking from day one, and the earlier that you can get everybody together to collaborate on um, a treatment strategy and a, a functional goal-based strategy, the better your overall outcomes will be. And if that means getting um, the treating psychologist, the doctor, the injured worker, the employer, all in the same room, potentially facilitated by a rehab provider to make sure that whatever agreements are made are then implemented um, at a workplace within the guidelines and boundaries that have been set, then that will result in as good an outcome as you're going to get. But we, we know with poor, poor uh, communication and with poor collaboration in these highly complex cases, and when there's delayed action on the part of, of all the key players, the outcomes are substantially worse. Mm. Okay. Um, DL, do you want to uh, comment on um, collaboration? I know that you uh, spoke of it very early on and, um, and the importance of having uh, a discussion among the various players as, as soon as you can. I agree with everything that Frank said. I think early collaboration with all the stakeholders is of key importance to a successful return to work program. Um, absolutely essential. I often engage in, in where we get everyone in the same room and, and sash it out and come out with a shared goal at the end. In my, in my private insurance role, I regularly ring the treating doctors to have a discussion about a plan forward or as an independent doctor, I'm often ringing the treating doctor, mm. the rehab provider, the um, employer, and, and working together what the plan will be and sharing that with the employee and, and making sure we're all on the same page together. In my experience, unless everyone's on the same page, it doesn't work. Okay. It has a much okay. better outcome if they're all aligned. Right. And, um, and Stephen, I know the GP is often seen as um, uh, the gatekeeper uh, to uh, a lot of the, the resources. and. Uh, do we have Stephen still online? I, I wanted to ask you um, how best we can use the GP. Actually, I, I think these type of matters are actually treated very badly in general practice. Um, I think that there is a there's a big need 
for better education, or better education in pain, uh, better use of resources, uh, in fact, to access the resources. Often the GP in, in Matt's case would be just floundering, trying to solve the pain issue without looking at all the others. Yeah. Uh, and I think there, there should be something there that triggers saying, look, he needs a multidisciplinary team to treat him. Uh, if he ever got to a pain clinic from, from general practice, that's the first thing that they would do. Right. Uh, but often, you know, these things are, uh, GP don't often know how to actually access these type of resources. Okay. Um, is it possible to have all the, um, all the panelists back um, on the screen at the same time? That's terrific. Um, and because uh, I wanted to ask you if there are any key resources that you would advise people who um, may not be as familiar with the system, um, are there places that you would suggest they would look? Oh, look, I can briefly talk to that. Uh, in one of the last, the second last slide, I think there is a, a link to um, the national clinical framework. Mm -hmm. um, there originally were two separate frameworks for physical and mental health. They've been combined because the principles are the same. Um, DL referred to the health benefits of work uh, agenda. Uh, there is a consensus statement available on the uh, Australian Faculty of Occupational and Environmental Medicine website, uh, which summarises evidence about the uh, health benefits of engaging in employment. So there are a couple of uh, resources there. Okay. Um, any others? Um, I know that there is an APS group in rehabilitation, and I'm sure that they have a list of resources as well. So I'm just googling one that I've used a bit now. Comcare's put out a guide a few years ago. It's called Managing Mental Health in the Workplace, and I think that's a great guide and gives lots of ideas and recommendations <coughs> for what kind of modifications you can recommend to any an employee that are, okay. that are reasonable. All right. Okay, well, um, it's, it's nearly time to finish and uh, I want to thank um, all the participants for the wonderful comments coming through. I wish we had more time to, to address them. So Stephen, Frank, DL, Peter, thank you very much. Um, I have a note here from MHPN to encourage participants to uh, uh, consider setting up their own special interest network. Uh, or join an existing one, uh, exploring mental health and workplace injury. And uh, finally, uh, to encourage you to complete the exit survey before you log out. Um, it'll appear after the session closes, and then you'll, uh, all participants will be attendance um, within two weeks. So, um, and I need to do a plug for the next seminar, which is, uh, working together to support the mental health of families with preterm uh, babies. So um, I think we're heading out and thank you. Thank you all. Thanks for sooner. And, and participation. Lovely. Thanks. Good to see all Thanks, my colleagues. Bye-bye now.